In 2001, the United States Supreme Court ruled 6-3 to three that the Child Evangelism Fellowship Organization had the freedom of speech right to set up evangelical clubs in public elementary schools. Okay, so we know where we're going, okay. Twelve years later, a few of us decided to learn more about these clubs and how they operate. Well, we are on our way to the fairgrounds today for um, the Good News Club Spectacular with Child's Evangelist Fellowship. And we are going to meet Mr. Bob, the man in charge of it all. Hi, I'm Bob Fowler with Child Evangelism Fellowship. I'm the local director. For his morning meeting with all the volunteers. And uh, we're going to interview people and just go around and see what they're up to. We're here at the Jim Grand building. We just arrived and uh, we're about to go into the morning prayer meeting. So here we go. Since we were unable to film CEF in public schools, we did the next best thing and got permission to film their annual North Carolina Spectacular at the state fairgrounds. He was uh, explaining what I was there for to somebody else, and he mentioned, he said, I don't know why they're here, I don't know what, they're, what this course is about, but I gave him permission. He, he was suspicious, but he gave us consent. Which I think this is an awesome handout. You should definitely get this. We will. <laughs> yeah, it was pretty, it was very I mean, blunt, very straightforward. Pretty much lays it out. And welcome again to the Children's Good News Spectacular. The Good News Clubs are um, clubs that you can have that kids come to and can do fun things, sing songs, play different games, and where the leaders want to share the good news of Jesus Christ. The Good News Club has a very specific and deeply fundamentalist agenda. We're a fellowship of Christians to evangelize, proclaim the good news of Jesus to children. So how young do you think the kids who you're making a target towards are? Um, I think it's more of uh, like 5 to 12, 13. CEF specifically targets children K through 6 because they're the most vulnerable. They're more pliable then. They haven't really set their uh, set in their ways. What does your religion mean to you? Uh, it means a lot of stuff. A lot of stuff? It's a pretty big thing. 20 hundred. 20 hundred? <laughs> Is there an audience that you're focused on reaching today, or is it just for it must, The younger kids, I guess, that's what this is all set up for. Mm -hmm. And a lot of them have never probably heard about Jesus. And a few of the children didn't even seem to know that this was a religious event. Did you learn anything while you were here today? Nothing? I didn't. You didn't? I didn't. I learned about trees. Trees? Oh, okay. Did you learn about Jesus? Did you learn about Jesus? No. They uh, try to reach them as young as they can. We got a lost child. Yeah, we got some information about the Good News Club for you. Oh, great. Thank you. And in 2009, Luis Bush, this very high-level mission strategist, changed his focus. He came up with something called the 414 window, uh, and that is, uh, refers to children between the ages of 4 and 14. We do know that 86% of those who receive Christ as Savior do so between the ages of 4 and 14. And statistically, the older a person gets, the less likely they are to make a decision for Christ. They teach children to proselytize to their unchurched family and friends. And I started hearing about how the kids attending the clubs were targeting their peers for what I can only describe as faith-based bullying. Children have not learned yet just to be shy and to be afraid. They don't mind telling other people. So they're, they're a tremendous resource. At every Good News Club training I attended, children were offered points and prizes and sometimes even treats for recruiting their peers to the club. And I've had our children to take the bracelet and to go and share with their friends and say, you know, I had a chance to tell my friend about Jesus. And so children who have believed, accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior, and they have um, the reminder or the object lesson to better share their faith with others, children can do that. They're usually the ones that are gonna be very active in church. They're gonna be involved in mission trips. 
they're the ones that are going to be, I think, more active than the others and really ministry oriented. I want to tell you uh, the story about two little girls I know, uh, Ashley and Zoe. Uh, they were on the playground when Ashley, who, was, who had just started attending a Good News Club, said to Zoe, you don't believe in Jesus, so you're going to go to hell. And Zoe said, that's not true. And things got a little heated, and the teacher overhearing the exchange decided to use this as a teachable moment. Different religions, she explained, uh, believe in different things. So Zoe was fine with that. But Ashley, the little girl attending a Good News Club, she was devastated. How can that be? And she, she burst into tears and started sobbing. I know it must be true because they taught it to me in school. And they don't teach things in school that aren't true. And do you think this should be incorporated into all the public schools around here? Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah? Yes, I do. I, I believe that this, they should bring uh, Christ back into, into the schools and, and uh, prayer and stuff like that. It's, I think that's very important. I mean, I think that's a, a good part of their strategy is if we can be part of the school and the teacher teaches them math, and then a few hours later the teacher is teaching them, you know, the wordless book, then yeah. uh, it adds a lot of credibility to their message, and I think that's a big part of their strategy. There was a curious thing about the appearance of a good news club in our kids' public school. It appeared that no one in the parent body had invited them in. If any of the public schools will allow a club after school, then uh, they can come in and, and have their club there. Now, how is this legal? You know, this is a question that I kept coming up against. Well, it's all because of a 2001 Supreme Court decision, Good News Club versus Milford Central School, and that decision um, in which the court argued that um, uh, religion is nothing more than speech from a certain point of view, and therefore these religious activities are um, protected under the free speech clause of the First Amendment. In his dissenting opinion for the minority, Justice Stevens wrote, Must it therefore allow organized political groups, for example, the Democratic Party, the Libertarian Party, or the Ku Klux Klan, to hold meetings, the principal purpose of which is not to discuss the current event's topic from their own unique point of view, but rather to recruit others to join their respective groups? I think not. Such recruiting meetings may introduce divisiveness and tend to separate young children into cliques that undermine the school's educational mission. School officials may reasonably believe that evangelical meetings designed to convert children to a particular religious faith pose the same risk. The courts pushed free speech so far that the Establishment Clause of the First Amendment, uh, which prohibits government endorsing or funding of an establishment of religion, has been eviscerated. Our ministry is to reach the unchurched, the unreached children, get them in the Bible, and then to get them in the local Bible believing church for Christian growth. And that's our purpose. Last year there were more than 3,500 good news clubs in public schools, most of them elementary schools. And so this child that may have this teaching of atheism at home, they can transfer that, think about it, have you know their class or whatever organizations like this um, speak to them and inform them and they can make their own informed decision. Good News Club leaders who experienced opposition from school communities or concern from administrators were urged to um, force their way into the public schools. They were asked, you know, told to sue and given eight, an 800 number and promised free legal representation. It's not government's job to do what, what Jesus commissioned his church to do. It's not biblical. It's like, well, we're not against Christians. We just want to make that clear. No, just the I ideas. think you guys are really nice, actually. And we had a nice conversation with them. Mm -hmm. uh, we just don't think their ideas are, are correct. And we think the things that they're doing are wrong uh, by, you know, targeting children. We think they shouldn't be targeting children. If they want to wait till the kids grow up and then talk to them and tell them all the, the wordless book and everything else, it's fine. Let them make their own decision. This is uh, the Good News Club's training manual. Um, these lesson plans are used in every Good News Club from coast to coast. There is no room for deviation from the script or spontaneous reinterpretations. How do they choose to story, uh, tell the story of Saul and the Amalekites, um, the story in which Saul, uh, God tells Saul to go kill all of the Amalekites, including the children and the babies? 
the men and the women and uh, the animals. So Saul fails to kill all of the Amalekites. How do they think this lesson should be taught to five and six year old children in public schools? Let's go through the lesson a little bit. They write here, if you're asked to do something, sweep the floor, clean your room, how much of it do you need to do before you can say, I did it? Yes, you need to do all of it. If you only partly obey, you are actually being disobedient. And then they talk about how God told Saul to kill all the Amalekites. They say, Samuel was careful to explain what God wanted Saul to do. You are to go and completely destroy the Amalekites, people, animals, every living thing. Nothing shall be left. That was pretty clear, wasn't it, they say. And then they make clear that the Amalekites um, had heard about uh, God many years before, but they refused to believe him. The Good News Club likes to market itself as an organization that teaches morals. Well, let me tell you what the supreme moral for the Good News Club is. Obedience. Complete obedience. Under any circumstance. Including obeying commands to commit genocide, if that's what God commands. And then in the teaching statement, in three separate places, it says, teaching statement, have the children shout, God will help you obey. Here it is again, teaching statement. Um, have children shout, God will help you obey. And they, you know, just to drive the point home, they say, partly obeying is disobeying. Saul should have been willing to seek God for strength to obey completely. So basically, the lesson teaches that if God is giving the order to kill everybody, it must be done to the letter. And uh, the reason why this is deeply concerning is that um, many uh, scholars have noted that throughout history, the story of Saul and the, Amal and the Amalekites has be been used to justify genocides. We may or may not know what his purpose for asking him to do those kinds of things were. And, uh, and I think, you know, for me, I take the Bible for what it says. Uh, if God ordered it, then it was, it was good. So then did you have religion taught in your school growing up? Well, actually, we were homeschooled. Oh, okay. so. <laughs> Yeah, so it was. <laughs> so, yes. But yeah. do you think it should be taught in all of the public schools to everyone? Well, I think it's something that a lot of the kids should know about, definitely. And I think that they need to be more educated about what it is because there's a lot of false concepts about Christianity and stuff. So I think it would be a good idea. Yeah, okay. And what about parents who aren't quite sure if their children should be taught that or not? Like if they don't want their, their kids hearing about it? Yeah, well, I don't know. <laughs> we'll have to think about it. And there are other religions and I don't think taxpayers want to pay for this religion if they belong to another faith or no faith at all. And I know there are issues on the other side of that, that if you promote Christianity, you've got to promote Hinduism, you've got to promote Buddhism. Um, but I think uh, from our founding fathers, uh, early years in the school, they were allowed to use the scriptures as a literary textbook, as a reading textbook. Uh, and I think uh, we ought to have the privilege of being able to use uh, scripture in school. Now we've got some folks now that don't know there's a difference between what's Caesar's and what's God's. Some theocrats or would-be theocrats who, who, you know, they kind of like the idea of a theocracy because they think they might get to be Theo in that <laughs> theocracy. And uh, they really are leaning in the direction of God governing. Oh, watch them. In the 1840s, in Philadelphia, people fought and died in the streets over this issue of uh, religion in the public schools. Several dozen people were killed, a convent was torched, and in Boston, uh, uh, a little boy named Thomas Wall was told by his priest uh, not to read from the King James Version of the Bible, his family was Catholic. And uh, the next day at school, he refused when his teacher asked him to do that. And he was beaten for 30 minutes. 
And the next day, the boys in his school, uh, would, who were overwhelmingly from Catholic families, um, walked out of the school. 400 boys walked out of the school in protest. These and other incidents like them that took place in Maine, in uh, Cincinnati, and other places um, so persuaded uh, the Catholic Church that the schools were not for them, that they formed at no small expense, as you can imagine, a system of parochial schools in order that uh, children of Catholic families would not be converted to a form of the Christian faith that they didn't agree with. In fact, I believe in Catherine Stewart's book, you know, she talks about how they were offered to teach in the church right across the street from the school. And they didn't want to be there, they want to be in the school. That's a big part of their, their plan. So things started to get very heated in the parent body and a group of parents really, you know, who are many of whom happened to be evangelical, decided to meet with the Good News Club leaders and, and they did so. They requested a meeting and they said, look, we know you mean well, but you're just not right for our school. May we offer you free and better space in the evangelical, literally next door to the school, at the same time and, and for free. And the Good News Club leaders declined. They said the school was where they wanted to be. They know very well that young children cannot distinguish between an activity that takes place in their school and one that is sponsored by their school. Well, now, what about the parents of uh, non-Christian children who wouldn't agree with this, who don't want their kids being taught this? Well, <laughs> that's, you know, yeah. it's hard to, uh, I, I don't know what to say about that. Yeah. It's, it's. They were putting religious literature on his desk every single day at school, and he would take it and throw it in the garbage because he's not a member of this form of the Christian religion and thinks it's inappropriate for them to keep giving him literature. And this is getting really annoying for him. So she went to the pastor of the church where all the youth boys were members, well, where all the boys were members of a youth group, and she said, "You know, I know you mean well, but we get it. You, you know, we get it. We see the literature, but can you just have these boys stop, stop, you know, harassing my son?" And he said, "Lady, I don't care about you. We want your kid, and we're going to keep doing what we do." So what this is, it's, it's not religious sharing. This isn't just kind of chatting with your friends about your faith at school. This is kind of religious bludgeoning and kind of religious bullying when, this kind of, when kids are subject to this kind of campaign. And all of a sudden you've got two camps in your school and you've divided the school. You've, you know, how's the PTA meeting going to go after that? It was not freedom uh, from religion, it was freedom of religion. There are many today who, who want to make it a one-way street, who want to say, well, it's only to protect religion from government that we have separation. Oh, it's also to protect government from religion. I think that we should go back and look at really what is separation of church and state. I don't think it is a good concept because that's what our forefathers, this is what America was grounded on. That's what our forefathers believed in was God. And that shouldn't be taken out because that's what makes America, America, the great place to be, the place of opportunity. And without God being our foundation, I can only foresee this country as a whole deterring from the greatness that it has all the potential and that it always has been. We have Baptists. Can you believe it? We have Baptists who wear the name Baptist and think they deserve to and don't. <laughs> because if there is a a key insight that has bound Baptist in this country and in Europe and in South America and in, the, in Asia and other parts of the world together. It's this understanding of church state separation. Uh, on the right, you have those who, who want to do away with or ignore church state separation. Falwell and Robertson said it's a myth. It's not a reality. Children are told that they were born sinful, that they are desperately wicked, 
I believe that I, I was destined for hell. The moment I uh, sinned as, as a child, when I did something that was against God, yeah. I deserved death and death eternally. Every human being without a savior, I believe goes to hell. Actually, I'm Muslim, but we do acknowledge Jesus, just not in the sense of, and not in the sense of being a God or the Son of God. We, we recognize him as a prophet. The Good News Club seeks to present itself as being broadly Christian, with non-threatening labels like non-denominational or interdenominational. But in fact, most activists I met with the Good News Club believe that most Americans who call themselves Christian really aren't, including U.S. Episcopalian, United Methodist, um, United Church of Christ, uh, Catholics, which I was shocked to hear described as a whole other religion. Are your kids Christians? Yes, my son is Lutheran. How'd you hear about this? Uh, McDonald's, my niece eats a lot of McDonald's. So McDonald's was promoting this? Yes. Uh, McDonald's has been supportive of the event. Uh, Chick-fil-A has been supportive of the event. Uh, clearly, the, the state fairgrounds have been supportive of the event. So those, there's a number of people and individuals who have given mo monetary support to CEF because uh, they work completely off of donations. Uh, brochures were put out in all the McDonald's and Chick-fil-A's and around to invite kids, people coming because it's absolutely free. What do you think about the uh, the recent Chick Fil A controversy? I loved it. I loved it. It's my kind of people. There you go. That's what it's all about. They try to hurt them, but they made a lot of money off that hurt. <laughs> you know, I saw it was on Facebook. I saw a picture of a McDonald's Golden Arch marquee, and it said, "We support Chick Fil A. Try to boycott us." Wow. Wow. McDonald's said, "You're not taping that." Of course I am. So this is my ten minutes of fame. <laughs> this is Bert. Bert. <laughs> That's my 10 seconds of fame right there. And this is a quote from their lesson. Uh, your heart, the real you, is sinful from the time you were born. Even the good things you do aren't good enough. The Bible says those things are like filthy, dirty rags. Filthy rags either need to be thrown away or washed. And that's lesson two, page 17. So this is what they teach kids. Now we believe that you can start teaching those principles um, obviously as a, a, a kindergartner, as a first grader, as a second grader, we believe that as a child recognizes their sinner, they'll see their need for a savior. For me, it was second grade, age of seven. They're really targeting kids in this really young age group. The centerpiece of their program is called the wordless book. It's got no words, just pictures and shapes, and it's used to convert children who are too young to read. They'll ask the children, have you ever seen a book like this before? How's it different from most books? And then we like to start with the gold page, and the gold page reminds us of heaven, streets of gold, pearly gates and mansions. But there's one thing that you and I have that can't be in heaven. The dark page reminds us of sin. They're explained examples of sin, like when mom tells us something to do and we don't do it, taking something that's not ours, telling something that's not true, and how that all of us were born with that want to do wrong. And not one wrong thing can be with God in heaven. And it separates us from God, so the opposite sides of the book. And the red is what God did for us to get to heaven. He sent Jesus. He died on the cross for you and me, took your, our place and our punishment on the cross, and gave his life, shed his blood. Jesus didn't stay dead. He came back alive. He's alive today. And he wants to forgive us of our sins and wash them away if we believe in him. And then there's one last page they're taught, which is the green. It's also on our bracelet. And it's how to grow as a Christian after you've believed and accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And they're also reminded that there's only one way to get to heaven, and that is Jesus. And there's no other way we can get there. The end of time? Yeah. What is he? What is he? Well, it's when Jesus Christ is coming. He's going to come back, and he's going to make it his throne again here on earth. And he's going to take those who believe in him. Um, there will be a significant time where who, people who aren't believers, they'll be they'll be able to believe, but those who don't, then, you know, it's it's heaven or hell. This is Amir, this is Kareem, and this is Jalil. Are you having fun? Yes. I hear people say, uh, come quickly, Lord Jesus, and I don't say that, because if he comes quickly, there are a lot of people that have never heard the gospel. So I think, uh, you know, we need to take advantage of every opportunity that we have to, to make sure the gospel gets out to all the people. 
sometimes people complicate lots of matters. That's the nice thing about it being a children's ministry is we get to simplify things. Yeah. Pressurable kids. And an obvious message referring to hell. You've got flames burning underneath this guy unless he goes up to God. Like that, that is telling kids that they're going to die and, and be tortured forever. The Good News Club curriculum includes over 5,000 references to sin, over 1,000 references to obedience, and over 1,000 references to punishment. It also includes 52 direct uses of the word hell, and over 250 allusions to the concept of hell. In the course of my research uh, on the Good News Club, I met a lot of really wonderful individuals who work with the CEF, who I believe really mean well for the children that they serve uh, and the communities in which they're working. Um, uh, one lovely man gave me his well-worn Bible and uh, others, uh, other CEF workers that I met uh, were just gentle spirits and really kind of showed me an awful lot of personal warmth. Um, unfortunately, I think that all of their good intentions are being harnessed in service of a national agenda that will ultimately erode our communities and harm public education as a whole. Then one guy came up and asked us specifically, he says, hey, can we get a flyer? Uh, <laughs> sure. sure. <laughs> so we gave it to him and sure thing, went straight to the people running in uh, the, the blue shirts or whatever, whatever shirts they were. So the six of them, like, I guess the first guy came up on a bike, he's like, Skirt! he went really, really fast and close yeah. to you too. He's, yeah, he's really close. Stops right here. They're like, hey man, how you doing? And he's like, well, you know, um, you can't hand out those flyers. Like, really? Okay. He's like, uh, well, it's soliciting. Like, oh, okay. So uh, they were very nice and we were very cordial. We said, well, we don't want to do anything that's against the law or, you know. Oh, okay, so uh, we just think what you're doing is wrong. We think that you shouldn't use children to proselytize to other children. We think that uh, coming in and using the school and making your program look like it's part of the school is uh, a violation of separation of church and state, and it's misleading, and it's uh, you know it's unfair, and we think it's bad for children. Um, I'm going to talk to you. But, but we're, we're going to go ahead and handle this. If you go ahead and do the event in there, that'd be great. Why are the people who are here protesting here? What? Um, it's the first time I've had anyone to have a disagreement with us at a spectacular. And uh, I found out they were handing out these yellow papers outside. And so I took one and read it. And I found out that what it was is they're protesting, not this event per se, uh, they're actually protesting that Child Evangelism Fellowship has Bible clubs in public schools. Now, when we do that, um, we have the same one, the Supreme Court ruling in 2001 that gave us equal access. It means it may, that we don't have less rights, we have equal rights with all the other clubs that meet on public school property. What this has essentially done, by the way, is not put the Good News Club on equal footing with after school soccer and art, because after all, administra administra administrators can exclude after school uh, start, uh, art or soccer or any other activity for any number of reasons. They can just decide, ah, oh, we don't want to have any art classes, it's too messy or whatever. Or, you know, we don't want to have karate because we don't want kids learning how to fight on campus. But the one category they cannot exclude is uh, a religious activity like Good News Club. So basically that 2001 decision has elevated these religious activities to a kind of super category of activity they have. Um, more rights to be there than any other uh, category because those other categories can be excluded. So I guess that's a long way of answering your question. Are school administrators uh, guilty in any of this? Uh, absolutely not. Many of them uh, really, you know, shudder when the Good News com Club comes to town. A public school is just a fact of life, so we know that they're going to be taught some things that we know are not true. But What my dad just said, we were not apes, and apes did not turn into people. It's crazy. So you think if they tried to teach you that we evolved from like, people that were kind of like apes, do you think that you would believe that, or would you argue with that, or just not say anything? I would say no, so, and I would just say no, and then walk away. Da -da 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 -da. <laughs> The late Dr. Jerry Falwell and I were on many television programs together. One night uh, when we were literally in the same studio, I asked him if he had read a new story on the front pages of most newspapers about a new fossil, a so-called intermediate fossil, which of course people who believe in creationism say, well, there's, there are gaps in the fossil record. I asked him about it because it was so prominent. He looked at me and said, Barry, you know I don't read that stuff. 
I'm sorry, but that is not the way a thinking person with a brain, which presumably Dr. Falwell thought he got from God in a very direct way, to ignore the truth, to not use the faculties you have to learn the truth is an appalling statement about what kind of a person you are. It couldn't be much more than, you know, five, six thousand years old. And so, uh, and, you know, things and science do not challenge, you know, me and my faith. I believe everything the Bible says. If, if God said he put all those animals in the ark in a cracker box, I would believe it. In that same lesson plan, they, they make sure to tell kids that failure to accept um, this sort of uh, creationist uh, understanding is uh, a sin which deserves punishment by death. They have purposely left out our Christian heritage in public schools, which I believe there is a effort to rewrite history books and those types of things. Uh, in discrimination against Christianity and in discrimination against our heritage and I believe it should be included. So obviously I would believe that it should be creation should be included because I believe evolution is a theory and it is a, um, a way to give a reason for everything that excludes God. I think that Adam and Eve did exist and that that's how the world began. It's yeah, hard to imagine that people still believe that. It's just hard to believe that you could believe in Adam and Eve. I mean, there's just way too much evidence and information out there to, uh, to believe the world is only 6,000 years old. Well, I think that when they introduced the Darwin theory, they're kind of saying that this is how it happened. You know, this is the only explanation. This is the only you know, way that this could have happened. And they're not really having an open mind and introducing, like if they introduce that one theory, why not introduce like Christian, like how why God made the world and like why not introduce other things and stuff so, so I guess you, as a Christian mm -hmm. were you as the homeschool were you introduced to the Darwin theory as well as the Christian theory um not so much it is the foundation and I think that it's tragic to um, dismiss children's possibilities in science by not teaching them science. I've been at this a long time, and for decades I've been hearing people say, well, it is a Christian country, but we don't want to have a theocracy, meaning they don't want a government strictly run along Christian religious lines, but I think they're fibbing about that. I think in general, people on their so-called religious right want to create a Christian-based, Bible-based legal system in the United States. And if you're a non-Christian, you are a second-class citizen. It's important, I think, to protect that moral fiber. And for me, like I said, in my faith, it's easy for me to vote to try to do that and try to promote legislation in Raleigh to do that. So would you support uh, going back to some of those those laws oh, that were biblically based, like, oh, uh, like uh, anti-sodomy laws and things like that? Sure, I think that things like that, uh, you know, are definitely are, are good, and uh, I think we should support laws that prohibit these these bad things. Our main focus is for them to hear the um, gospel message, but to allow them the fun to draw them into that and everything. Um, and then they get to, of course, go on the big, huge, giant jumpy after hearing the gospel message and getting their bracelet. It seemed like they were almost bribing the children with this fun day and working religion into it. The Child Evangelism Fellowship distributes a book called The Plan. It's this massive sort of uh, 400 pages of tab material in a, in a binder that covers every single aspect of establishing a good news club. You know, that plus having the you know, legal backup, like right there, copy and send legal letters. We took a long document to the um, principal showing how we could do that in love. Again, we had prayed about it a lot in love and said, you know what, this is what my child's rights are and we're not going to tell the teacher what it is, even though she can look, but we're not going to announce it, we're just going to pass it out. And he legally looked at it and said, you, yeah, you can do that because I can't stop you. They don't care what the parents believe. They don't care how the kids are being raised or what the parents' choices are. Uh, they're happy to go into a school and uh, essentially work the kids against each other. The organization of CEF has an actual school in Warrington, Missouri, where their head home headquarters is. And there is actually an institution where we can send young people 
they go through a course on how to teach the gospel, how to share it publicly, and how to gear it towards kids. I'm a firm believer in the freedom of speech and the freedom of religion, but turning public schools into a state-subsidized missionary network for the promotion of you know, one form of religion has little to do with either. Everybody thinks the golden rule is a, a fair way to do things. Um, and, and so I, I, was, I was thinking about how, how do you apply the golden rule in the church state area and, I, and I've kind of come up with this. It would go something like this. I, I must not ask government to promote my religion if I don't want government to promote somebody else's religion. And I must not permit government to harm somebody else's religion if I don't want government to harm my religion. You know, to me, that just seems so commonsensical, so uh, fundamentally fair uh, th that it's hard to, to, to dispute. What do you think the Good News Club is going to do today? Well, hopefully spread the good news. <laughs> to allow adults to come into our public elementary schools and tell 5 to 12 year old children that they deserve to die. It's never appropriate. It's wrong, and we can stop it, and we have an obligation to stop it.